today we just announced our really big announcement, as you call it, a bazooka. How do you feel? I mean, it's um, exciting and intimidating all at the same time because now everyone knows what we've been working on for the last few years with um, our co-founders here, but also you know, the the game just starts now, in a sense, you know, we get to to launch this today, but now we've got to get out there and kind of make it real. And those things are both ex exciting and scary, because there is it is such a big thing to um, try and bring to the world. And the, um, I mentioned on Twitter today, you know, the ideas of the open metaverse are, are the are the ideas that are portrayed in this story. And you know, Ready Player One tells the story of community over corporations it tells the story of personal digital ownership it taught it tells the stories of interoperability um and those are all the things that we've been wanting to bring to the world um and create with the technology that we've been building over the last five five or so years um and this um ip is like the manifestation of that in most people's minds around the world and so um, feel very lucky and very excited, but also feel the weight of that responsibility to get out there and do a good job of it. Yeah, it's so funny on announcement days because people always text us like, congratulations, congratulations. And we're both like, well, we're just starting now. So like, there's nothing, yeah. <laughs> now here we go and now we build. So I know you and I share that and um, I know our partners share that too. So without further ado, we will introduce our very special guest today, Mr. Ernie Klein and Mr. Dan Farah, of which who need no introduction to who they are and what they do, <laughs> because everyone knows the legendary creator of Ready Player One and Dan Farah, who produced Ready Player One and partnered with Ernie. So welcome, guys. We're excited to have you here. Oh, thank you for thank having you. us. Beamed in from my garage. I'm excited <laughs> here. Beamed in from your garage. Now our community knows that on our last show, Aaron and I were in your garage by way of the photo that you sent us of your garage. But now that you're physically in there, you can stand up so that everyone knows you're actually it's in true. there. That's actually, not it's real. Actually, it's and, I'm actually here. And it. I've, I know you'll be giving us a tour of those DeLoreans in a few minutes. So yes. Um, before we do that, though, congratulations to you guys, too, because we've been all working on this for so long, and we're so excited to be here and be holding hands with you guys to do something absolutely insane. But it affirms that you guys are insane, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's an epic day. It begins. So, okay, before we do the tour of the DeLorean, let's go back a little bit because I'm sure everyone's really interested in, in knowing how this all came to be. So, Dan, do you want to take it away and, and tell us the, the backstory? Yeah, yeah. So it's been a long journey to get here. Um, Ernie and I started collaborating on the Ready Player One uh, franchise when he was still finishing up the, the book years ago. And from the very beginning, from our first conversation, uh, we were talking about how we want to one day be a part of bringing these awesome ideas Ernie had for how the future could be impacted um, by the metaverse, you know, by the evolution of the internet and video games and social media. Um, and uh, we, uh, we wanted to bring it about, but the technology wasn't there at the time. And so uh, mission one was, you know, create and launch like a really successful book property. Uh, and Ernie obviously did that incredibly well, wrote an amazing novel. Um, and then uh, mission two was turning into a movie so that people could see what that would look like and start getting those ideas in their head. And that would inspire technology to be built and get there. And uh, you know, that mission was accomplished with the awesome movie that, that Steven Spielberg directed. And um and then it was a couple of years ago where the technology started to actually catch up with these ideas. And uh, we, we started talking to leaders in the metaverse tech space. And um, that's when we met, we met Sharon Aaron and uh, the Futureverse team. And their tech was leaps and bounds above uh, everyone else, ahead of everyone else. 
And we shared the same vision for what the metaverse could be for its potential. And we shared the same you know, moral compass for how to do it, how to do it right, and how to make it good for everyone. And um, yeah, we came together about a couple of years ago and started putting together the plans for this and building this. And, and then we, we uh, went to Warner Brothers and we made uh, this great arrangement with Warner Brothers to exclusively um, run with the, uh, the specific, these specific rights, we'll say Web3 rights to the Ready Player franchise. And um, yeah, and then here we are now announcing it's the world. Now, now we have to get to work. <laughs> and now we're announcing Readyverse Studios, which was birthed a bit ago, but we announced it today. And so, Ernie, are you a psychic? I, I, I think I'm really <laughs> lucky. Uh, uh, really lucky really? with uh, timing, you know. Uh, no, uh, no, it, no, no, no. You yeah. have to be some sort of, I mean, we know you're a visionary, but the level of of how you outline this for in a way that it, it's actually going to truly come to be is wild. Do you feel like like what led you to think conceptually of this? Um, oh, I'm like you guys. I'm a child of uh, uh, of video games. I you know was lucky enough to be born uh, uh, in the, the same year that Pong. Uh, was invented so uh, my, you know my parents generation didn't have video games at all or got them when they were adults and I was lucky enough those were you know those were our toys uh, growing up and uh, they were they were little simulations playing adventure uh, or Yars Revenge on my Atari 2600 those were those were the first uh, consumer available uh, simulations of little uh, worlds and uh, and that was a huge part of my childhood exploring these these worlds. And so when I, you know, when I got around to writing my first novel, they tell you to write the, write the story you've always wanted to read. And, uh, uh, and I ended up writing about the video game that I'd always wanted to play, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the ultimate video game, you know, and it was easy watching the evolution of video games through the seventies and eighties, the nineties. Um, and when I started to write this book in the aughts, you could see, you know, every year the resolution you know, uh, 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 the, uh, what people, uh, computers were capable of rendering um, uh, seemed to double, you know. I remember walking through like a, a Best Buy and seeing a row of televisions. I thought they were playing a football game, but it was the latest version of, uh, uh, you know, an NFL game that looked exactly like real uh, coverage. And um, uh, and all that, you know, you could see I would get, uh, that eventually video games are going to become indistinguishable from reality, you know, uh, and you'll be inside video games. And what would that be like? What would the coolest possible future video game be like? Um, and that video game would have to encompass all existing, you know, simulations, everything you could already simulate, you could do inside that world and have it be interconnected and interoperable and all work. So if you got a light, if you went to Tatooine and got a lightsaber uh, and then went to uh, over to the simulation of Arrakis, your lightsaber would still work there you know or you know if you went into an area where technology maybe wasn't allowed but magic items uh would work all these fun things that you know also being a child of role-playing games and Dungeons and Dragons and game mechanics I think I applied a lot of like role-playing game mechanics to my vision of what the uh oasis would be but all of that you know it's so much easier to sit at your typewriter and like wouldn't it be cool if you know it worked like this uh, and that was what was so exciting, you know, uh, uh, to meet you guys and to get to collaborate with you because immediately I saw these are the people who are, uh, they're actually going, going to do it for real. Uh, mm -hmm. What I imagined, it's going to happen like 30 years sooner than I imagined. And these are the guys who are going to do it. And by some miracle, because of the other miracles that have already happened uh, with the book and the movie, like I'm going to get to have a, a play a role in that and and uh, in helping lay the groundwork for an open metaverse that everybody will get to be you know a, a part of I, I think of it as a new country we're like laying the groundwork for a new country that everyone will be a part of that has no borders you know physical or you know uh, with our imagination it's just so exciting i went on a rant but no, that, that was oh, that's a perfect rant and i think like the notion of um pong being the first kind of experience is such an such an interesting and cool one because that's kind of how um we me and me and the the founding team um back in the day 
when we started this thing, started thinking about um, the next generation of gaming is we built an AI um, uh, proof of concept of an AI playing a Pong game as part of how do we kind of democratize and, and make um, artificial intelligence in this next generation of technology available and owned by everyone. Um, it was a, it was a Pong game. So that's wow. so cool that kind of that's where you start, you right? That's, that's yeah. Genesis. That's where you uh, uh, start. And that's what's so exciting to me. Like this is, it's not just the next version of the internet. It's also the next version of video games and the next version of everything that we do digitally. Uh, you know, it's the new, you know, it's what I imagine Tron being like when I saw that movie in 1982, you know, like it's the digital frontier yeah. that you, we've always, you know, uh, 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 imagined when, that I, you know, have grown up imagining. And then when I try to put it all into that book, I was, you know, it's, I was like trying to, you know, how long will it take for all of this to happen? You know, oh, maybe about, you know, the book came out in 2011 and I think I, I imagine it in 2045 or 2040s, uh, but the very first version of the Oasis comes out right about now. Uh, and then slowly hmm. evolves, you know, and that's what I'm excited about is we're laying the groundwork for 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 what will become, you know, the real version of the Oasis that everybody gets to uh, uh, hang out with their friends and uh, and with their family. And it'll erase geographical distance between people and allow us all to communicate and collaborate in a in a space that we control. It's uh, unprecedented in human history. It's uh, really exciting to get to be a part of it. You know, I want to step back for a second because I found it was really interesting, as you guys know, because you were there in all of our interviews around the Readyverse Studios announcement, a lot of journalists would say, okay, so you guys are building a metaverse. And Aaron and I always talk about how it's not a metaverse, it's the metaverse. You don't go around and say, I'm building an internet. Someone would look at you like you're insane if you're like, I'm building an internet. You don't, you build the metaverse and everything interconnects together. So for the people who haven't heard Aaron and I speak at nauseum about what the metaverse is, Aaron, why don't you take us through our definition of the metaverse? Because Ernie just touched on so many amazing components of it, but a lot of people are gonna be watching this and saying, cool, Ernie envisioned it, then it became a movie. Well, how does it become real? What even is it? So let's give the quick overview of what is the metaverse? Yeah, um, so a few kind of simple ideas. I think, um, like you mentioned, it's it's the internet growing up um, and there's some really um, specific and um, interesting new properties that come alongside that. And so the first one is this idea of um, convergence. You know, convergence is um, something that has been happening on the internet for a little while now and is starting to speed up. Um, and I think a really good example of what that could be is the idea um, of social media. You know, prior to um, that coming about, we had these kind of discrete silos where we would consume bits of the internet. We would have communications, we'd have media, we'd have gaming, we'd have finance, we'd have banking, um, we'd, we'd have all of these different things that we would go to. And, and and even back then, you know, those early days, um, they were built on different networks, you know, media companies and communications companies had totally different networks. That's how far apart they were. Um, and what we saw with social media is media and communications coming together in a singular user experience. And that user experience became the default way that people consume media and communicate. So it crushed those two things into one. Um, and that journey has continued on the internet. You know, we see now um, commerce, which was this very discreet thing and huge thing in its own right in on the internet, you know, Amazons and, and, the, and Alibaba's and the like. And now the fastest growing place to do commerce is inside of that same social experience with TikTok. And so social commerce becomes another thing that becomes part of that um, seamless user experience for, for the user. And so convergence of all these different things is one of those um, hallmarks of the metaverse. The second thing I think um, that goes alongside that is immersiveness. Um, and so um, taking that same analogy, you know, the way that we communicate 
um, on online has become more immersive. And you think back to, you know, writing letters through to um, picking up the telephone through to being able to make video calls um, and through to being able to do stuff like this. All of those are steps along the journey of immersiveness where we can be a part of the same thing that other people are a part of. Um, just like um, I mentioned earlier, the social commerce is an immersive form of commerce. You're in the space with the person who's selling the thing and you can interact with that thing and that person in real time. Um, and so if we've seen kind of the different versions of the internet over time progress from you know flat web screens into um, mobile um, experiences that you can take everywhere with you and more recently into immersive you know 3d experiences you know the default internet that i had as a as a young engineer growing up and building this stuff compared to you know my son um who's just uh, graduating university now were very different and his default internet was a more immersive internet and so um, this is like a progression of um, those two ideas convergence and immersiveness and i think the third thing which is really important talks to the values that we share around this stuff is ownership. You know, the internet of the 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 current internet and the internet we're trying to change um, doesn't give ownership to the users and the communities that exist with inside of that. Um, and I think a really important thing for a society that becomes more digital and um, where more of the things we value is are in the digital space and. Um, even the process that affect our physical world happen in digital um, spaces or affected by digital processes, ownership becomes extremely important. And so putting the control back into the hands of users and communities for the things they value, their who their social networks are, the communications that they have with their friends and family and 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 businesses and things around the world. All of those things need to be controlled and owned by communities, and so those are those those are the three things we see the internet, uh, the metaverse is. It's the internet growing up, and so all of those things can be encompassed in what we're trying to build here. It's not about gaming, it's not about, um, uh, you know, kind of um, creating a world. It's creating the foundation for digital ownership, for interoperability. Um, for the for the ability for users to create and the things that they can imagine and bring those to life in immersive spaces. Yeah, a bunch of people today were saying to me, "Oh, well, are you guys so you're just building a Ready Player One like game and experience?" And I was like, "No, that's not what the metaverse is about. The metaverse is about changing the the power construct effectively and giving an individual control of their data, control of their assets, control of their finances, control of everything that they own. We always say the metaverse it exists at the data layer. It's not just simply an immersive game experience. It's all of the infrastructure that's underneath, which we'll get into in a bit, in a bit. But before we do, I was just realizing that in my hand, I was spinning this extra <laughs> light token. And so before we go into more tech, Ernie, let's talk about wish fulfillment. And Dan, yes. of course, your movie producer and a creative. So there's, and and that's effectively a part of where it goes now after what Aaron just spoke about. We lay all the groundwork to make it actually work, but then it is about the things you can do and the way you can interact with the little assets and the things that you can collect, being able to go everywhere with you so that if I collect this extra life token, it's not physically, this is actually pretty heavy. And I know this is a rare collectible, so I'm holding on to it with dear life. But if I carried it in my pocket everywhere, it would be really heavy. So the idea of putting it in a digital space where everything can move through the world is is really what we're talking about building here and not talking about it. We've already been building it for six years. So here and we've been building for the last two years since we got we've all been speaking and working on this arrangement. I think a lot of people think, oh, now we saw this announcement, here comes Ready Verse Studios, now you guys are gonna put together a company and go do all the work. But we've actually been building for the last couple of years, all the pieces that we're talking about. So Ernie, let's talk about wish fulfillment and tell me your favorite wish fulfillment moment from the books. Favorite wish fulfillment moment from the book is probably 
uh, Wade's car, getting to have a flying <laughs> DeLorean was always my dream car and always the, uh, uh, you know, thing from pop culture that I wanted uh, to own and to have in my life uh, every day. And so uh, when I sold the book uh, to Crown Random House, uh, that was the first thing I did uh, was buy this DeLorean and um, uh, and then used it in my author photo and uh, drove it uh, on my book tour. I managed to make it, you know, a promotional tool to justify the wish fulfillment. Uh, but then I just, you know, I went overboard and bought another DeLorean to give away uh, in a contest to promote the paperback release of Ready Player One, uh, which I did and gave that away. Uh, but then the owner ended up uh, not having room for it. It wasn't something, not practical cars. So he sold it back to me and uh, 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 I turned it into a Star Wars Part, the Mandalorian. That's a work in progress. Um, uh, <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, that's like a wish for fulfillment for Wade in the book when he becomes Parzival, this idealized version of himself, you know, where he has control of what people uh, see when they interact with him and control of, you know, uh, his appearance and his voice and uh, uh, everything about uh, him and all of his items and everything uh, uh, like his DeLorean go with him anywhere he goes you know, uh, uh, in, in the metaverse, in the oasis, uh, in the book. So, um, uh, yeah, it's some just iconic thing. I think it's the coolest car ever cooler than the Batmobile. Uh, so yeah, getting to, you know, it continues to be wish fulfillment for me. I, this is, this is when I get writer's block and I needed to harness my chi. I come down here and, uh, uh, uh I become a creative thunderstorm, uh, in this room. So that, that justifies its existence. <laughs> Hey, e, talk, tell everybody a little bit about um, the idea of escapism and how you were influenced by your, your, your childhood growing up and like, you know, escaping, you know, creatively to another place, different than. Oh, your sure. Well, that's what, that. yeah, that's what video games were for me. It was like the first, you know, uh, and books, you know, uh, reading novels and uh, uh, television, you know, I had all these kind of different portals to other worlds. My Atari was one, and then I got my TRS-80. Uh, uh, and um, each, you know, and each kind of video game at the arcade, uh, each machine was like a portal to a different reality with its own rules. And um, uh, and then I started playing role-playing games, and that was even more powerful. That was like combining human imagination. Even though it was pencil and paper, it was still, uh, you know, just as powerful as, as video gaming. And sometimes in some ways more, because, you know, you're interacting with real humans who can improvise, uh, you know, uh, which, uh, so all of that, you know, was uh, kind of a culture of escapism that I grew up with. I loved escapism. I love the escapism of movies, especially. I was cinephile and uh, obsessed with uh, movies and wanted, always wanted to make movies. So, um, you know, I started out as a screenwriter before I wrote my first novel, I already had a movie uh, uh, produced. But um, that experience, you know, uh, 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 led me to want to have more control over my uh, my creative output and my creation so that I could, you know, uh, uh, present it to readers or to my audience uh, directly uh, and geek out as like hard as I wanted and go drill down as deep into you know, uh, nerd them as I uh, uh, imagine without anybody telling me that they don't know what the hell I'm talking about. They don't get it. Like I knew <laughs> the people who would get it, right? The right people would get it, you know? And uh, and all of that was just the, you know, also the window dressing for just getting to imagine the, uh, imagine the future and kind of extrapolate where internet culture and internet shopping and internet uh, uh, gaming and all of that. Uh, uh, what I think about, when I think about what we're doing now, I remember like the very early days of the internet when it went from something that very few people used uh, to something that everybody was using every day uh, uh, in the space of like a couple of years. And I feel like we're on the cusp of that with the, the metaverse. And what we're doing is what had to be done when the very first version of the internet was rolled out. And it was, you know, you had to create TCP IP and uh, file transfer protocols and uh, uh, all these different uh, things that were different pieces of of what would become the first version of the internet. Uh, and uh, it was very hard to use at the beginning, but eventually it became this seamless thing. And we're kind of creating the, the you know, you guys <laughs> are creating this, the seamless version of it from the beginning, um, uh, laying that uh, groundwork that has to be laid. If there's gonna be a, a free and open metaverse, 
um, uh, uh, you know, it has to be done. And, uh, and you know, uh, I'm so excited that we're doing it uh, uh, because it's going to, it's going to lead to amazing things. You know, what's amazing. Yeah, we, we genuinely are though. That's the thing. Like you're saying us, but I think the thing that's unique about um, the Readyverse and, and this partnership is that, um, you know, it is this marriage of um, technology, culture, um, creativity coming together and the people on both sides of that um, that aisle bringing what they have to the table to, to make it reality. Like, you know, the all the best technology in the world without the best stories to bring them to life are kind of worthless. And I think like that's what makes this kind of magical and special and unique in the space, to be honest, to have, you know, the creative um, people that, that um, are the, are the, are the best storytellers in the world come in and work with, you know, awesome technology to, to put those two things together. You don't see that very often. I think that's one of the things that makes this um, founding team really special. Yeah. And I think that to add on to that, which is spot on is that Ernie, there's not a lot of people like you also. So like you just started to touch and, and reveal to everyone how much you actually know about technology and coming from mm -hmm. a background of technology, which you, you don't, you didn't just allude to, but you just dropped some bombs. So now everyone knows that you know what you're talking about is why, like Aaron said, this is a really special collaboration. And I think, and Dan, you can jump in on this too. I'll, I'll just tee it up. I started my career in the movie business like Dan and, and having seen the history of Hollywood looking to technology companies and thinking, you're just going to steal our stuff. You're not going to do right by the people who who wrote it and created it and put their hearts and souls into it. You're just going to take it and try to make money from it. That's the big difference in laying a new foundation for the internet. It, it balances the way that people are compensated for the things that they put out into the world. And that's incredibly important to all of us here and was important to you guys and, and obviously how we came together. But I think that's one of the biggest things about the statement we really wanted to make with the founding of Readyverse Studios is it's technology and creatives as, as partners. And that's really important because Hollywood doesn't see that. They see just these weird conversations where people don't understand, they don't explain. And I know Dan and I have had tons of conversations with fellow film and TV executives and creatives and, and writers like yourself, Ernie, and them hearing, wait, Ernie Klein is a founder of this is a really big deal. And, and it was really, really important to Aaron and I that we partnered with creatives and that we served as the bridge between Hollywood and entertainment and technology, because if you don't understand how the entertainment industry works, which you guys know from some of the complications of clearing IP for one of the hardest clearing IP movies that ever was made, it's a really hard business. And you have to not only know the intricacy and how the industry works, but you have to have the relationships and then you have to do right by them. And so that's, I think, a huge part of what makes this really different and why I'm really grateful to be a part of this, this special team. Dan, anything you want to add on the, the Hollywood partner topic? And actually, you know yeah, what? No, why don't we talk a little bit about the value of what we're building for IP holders? Because I think a lot of them are looking at this saying, okay, we don't, we don't really understand the metaverse. We don't really understand why we need it because we make film and TV. That's our focus. So why should they expand their IP and, and start to think about ways of integrating it into these types of opportunities? Yeah, well, also first we can just say like why we wanna bring big IP to the Readyverse. And that's just simply because people love engaging with things they love, right? And so, you know, pop culture, movies, uh, TV shows, books these are things people love and so we want to bring them to the place where we want to bring people right like we want to give people things to do with things they love and so um that's why we want to bring you know great ip to the to the readyverse um and it's a great opportunity for movie studios and tv studios that own all these you know big properties or or other big creators like ernie um because we can a, expand their their fandom into the Readyverse. We can expand the reach of their IP, right? We can 
you know, offer them basically creative outlets to expand, you know, characters or stories that, you know, maybe they haven't, maybe they have an idea that um, isn't quite ready to be another movie or another TV show or another book, but they want to try it out. They want to start like feeling it out. We can go create content with them for the Readyverse. Um, so it's a creative outlet. Financially, it's a great opportunity to generate revenue uh, for your IP. If you're if you're a big movie studio, a television studio, a creator like Ernie, it's just another it's another form of revenue that you can you can work with us to be a part of shaping um, versus just handing it off like it's some kind of licensing deal and just you know throwing caution to the wind. You know, you be a part of it with us. And I think the fact that you know one of the four founders is Ernie. Uh, speaks to the fact that we're very creator friendly and we get it. Like we understand the concerns creators have, um, sensitivities to how things that people have conceived of are used. Right. And so, um, I think there's a lot of reasons Readyverse makes sense for creators and studios, uh, to engage with. And hopefully that results in a lot of really awesome IP being in the Readyverse, um, we know we're off to an amazing start with all the Ready Player, you know, rights and some other other big IP that we're uh, we're finalizing arrangements for right now. Um, but that, uh, yeah, that's the outlook on it. So on that point, there's pars of all behind Aaron and I, and I think that that's a really interesting segue because as as Ernie was talking about escapism, it's a really interesting part of the metaverse from a ton of different layers. Now I only from just the larger immersive experience. But when we think about the entryway into how you take part in these experiences, in a lot of ways, it begins with an avatar. And so obviously from the Ready Player One IP, we we have pars of all and, and everyone will see what we go on and do with the environments and the experiences and the characters. But Aaron, will you jump in a little bit to... Let's make this tangible because that's what the Readyverse and Readyverse Studios has set out to do is make the metaverse tangible. So let's talk about how a regular person will enter this and, and the beginning around the avatar and the passport just so that a larger audience understands when this is how the world will evolve. Like I said to a friend the other day, I was like, oh, well, when you're in the metaverse in a few years and he was like, not a few years, it'll be 30 years. And I'm like, it won't be because we're here, but when you're in there, you can't show up as you, Josh. Now I just outed him. His name's Josh. But he was like, why? I'm I'm me. I'm showing up as me. I'm like, well, at that point, you actually won't. Because if you look at what's going on in the world, and I don't want to make this too big, but I do want to make this point. When you look at what's going on in the world, people are judged immediately by everything. And we don't need to get into the politics of it all, but you're immediately judged by what you say, what you look like, what you do, how you think, if you even think, because let's be honest, on the internet, you have no choice. So you're not thinking about anything. We'll, we'll talk about that later. That's another part of what we're doing with Readyverse. But you, you're you just berated for being you everywhere you turn. So why wouldn't you want the opportunity to show up in a way where you can be what's in your heart, and that can change at any moment. You could show up as part of all wearing this jean vest, but suddenly you could put on a hat, a leather jacket, and jump in a DeLorean and you're off to the races. So Aaron, take us through a little bit the simple version of identity, the passport and the interoperability of it all, and tease, just tease, emphasize tease, don't say too much yet, but give us like a, a tangible overview of some of the stuff we're going to start rolling out very soon. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, um, you know, to kind of walk back a little bit to how this came together, um, you know, when the team talked about um, partnering with someone who had the technology to make it work, um, there aren't very many people out there that have gone, gone and deconstructed those layers that are required to build that up to that experience that we think that we see when you know when we know when we look at the movie and when you see that that's a whole bunch of really um, intricate things coming together to create that that outcome for um for end users and participants in that ecosystem um and those are the things that futureverse has been working on for the last seven years you know we kind of deconstructed what the metaverse would need to make it work um and while a lot of people are working on the individual bits of that 
um, there is, wasn't really anyone out there that was trying to pull them all together in that seamless way. Um, and so, um, so that's kind of what we've, our mission has been is to build those building blocks for the open metaverse so that we can enable experience like we've talked about today. And like you see, when you, um, you watch the movie or you imagine when you read the books, um, and by the way, if you haven't read Ready Player Two, go do that, you know, shout out to that right now, because, you know, this, um, partnership coll collaboration covers everything that's kind of being built around this franchise and everything else that ernie's been creating as well so um you might get some tips or um some alpha on on what could be coming down the track um the 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 bedrock i think of that ecosystem starts with identity you know and that's the thing that is um the glue that stitches that journey you might have between different applications and experiences together um and so in our world, um, that comes in two things. You've got um, your the data part of that, which is actually based on our future pass system, um, which is this kind of really simple way to onboard, create your own personal, um, you know, passport and and wallet to access and carry the stuff with you um, around the world. And so that shows up um, as a as a ready pass in in this world. Um, with that underlying technology. Um, the next part of identity is obviously the skin you wear. You talked about kind of being able to switch between different types of um, visual identity. And so we've been building the tools to make, to make those avatars and to make them seamless and interoperable between different environments. And that's, that's that underlying dot pipeline that our community will, will already know. Um, but others out there are starting to, a lot of others out there are starting to find out now is a very powerful tool for creating that interoperability. Um, Wait, then Aaron, we kind of move up. Explain, yeah. explain dot real quick, because it stands yeah, for so, Dynamic so, Object Transformer. And we blow past yeah. it, but it's one of our most prolific pieces of technology that makes the whole thing work. So explain dot like we're talking to our moms. Yeah. So when you when you see something like Ready Player One and you see people like jumping between these different experiences and donning different skins, um, that thing is actually really hard to do. And it's one of the reasons why the idea of the open metaverse hasn't actually been able to show up in reality for people. Um, and so, um, and the reason for that is that um, making those, 3D things is actually quite hard. And when you make them, you have to make them often specifically for the platform that they're going to show up on. So if you're making a mobile application, you make them in a certain way. If you're making a web application, you make them in a certain way. If you're making a um, console application, you'd make them a certain way. If you're making them for TV or movies, you make them a certain way. If you make them for um, Unreal Engine versus Unity, you make them in different ways. And so that's a that's quite a hard thing to get to work from an interoperability point of view um and in the past um you know the solutions to solving that interoperability have been um to narrow down what um can be made interoperable and so you end up with a very narrow set of things that can become interoperable and they have to fit into a certain kind of um you know, shape, size, format, resolution, usually the lowest common denominator, because that's how you achieve like broad interoperability. Um, what DOT does is allows creators and developers and even end users to access a pipeline that can um, generate um, content, let's say an avatar, um, in, in a range of different formats that fit best to the target the target device that that experience will be in so you can carry this little bit of data with you and when you go into an, uh, an application that's on mobile or versus web or versus um you know pc game on on unreal in unity you, the very best version of that um character will show up in that environment that's possible for the device in the environment that you're in and not on only that um Dot allows a huge wide range of creativity. And so we don't have to have characters that all look a certain way and kind of um, 
uh, fit a certain shape and size, they can be reflective of humanity and of our imaginations. And so you can have all sorts of shapes and sizes and ethnicities and colors and, you know, accessories and, and, you know, um, your, your creative creativity is not limited by, um, by interoperability. And that's one of the super cool things about dot is it kind of enables both the idea of the open metaverse, the portability of these assets, but the very best experience, experience and expression of those things, wherever you are. Yeah, I think what's really, I'm glad you explained that because I'm going to send this to my mom and see if she will understand. <laughs> I actually think she will, which is really important. And I want to make a point about Readyverse. So I know we didn't get into it too much at the beginning, so I'll do it now. But Aaron and I came together a few years ago and merged a bunch of infrastructure companies to create Futureverse. Futureverse's platform and technology stack, including our more than just a blockchain, the root network, will power all of the things that we build for the Readyverse. Futureverse is an infrastructure company. It's not meant to be a household name. It's similar to Intel Inside. It's something that if you're really, really interested in technology and you really want to know all of the weeds of this, then you come to the Futureverse as a developer and, and you learn about all the stuff we're building underneath the hood. And if you're my mom, you try really hard to listen to every one of our videos. And she's like, I don't understand. Aaron's so smart. What is he talking about? But she tries, which is really important. Now, what's super important about that is that when we set out to create the technology underneath the hood of Futureverse, we set out to say that it's intended to be really, really simple and it's intended to be invisible. And that's critically important. And one of the reasons why we haven't seen the metaverse come to fruition in the way we want, because the technology has been so clunky and the user experience has been so terrible that no one actually can maneuver how they onboard to anything. And so that's one of the really important factors here of Futureverse existing underneath the Readyverse, but Readyverse being the household name that consumers interact with from a brand perspective and an IP perspective. And I think that's a really important thing to distinguish because these words like interoperability, and, and I use this metaphor and have recently a lot, is people don't know what that term is. But when you think about how you exist in, in everyday life, I could go to Starbucks in the morning and buy a coffee using Starbucks stars. Then I could go to a bookstore, pick up a book using Apple Pay. Then I could go meet Dan for lunch and I use my credit card. I just used three forms of currency, but I haven't thought about what I did. And I didn't go brag to someone, hey, I just bought this thing using my Starbucks stars. That's been the early days of Web3 because it's early and new. And but people don't shouldn't know about it. They should just be able to do it and get into the wish fulfillment of it. And Aaron, I want you to give your analogy that's amazing about Netflix. And if a individual had to integrate a server in order to watch a movie, that is one of the best examples of understanding what we're doing here with the Readyverse and how we're trying to create a simple user experience and not do all of this process. Yeah, maybe I'll do that at the end of this kind of few, next few points about the underlying stuff. So we go like from identity, which includes that kind of um, passport and the, the the wallet to carry things around that you value. And then you kind of have the the um, the content layer of identity with your avatars and stuff on like the next kind of thing I think that um, is really important is to be able to carry the friends that you meet in the metaverse with you, you know, and this connection and openness of connectivity and, and building networks that are interoperable is an, is a next really important thing. And so, um, we've been working, you know, under the hood with the, the silo protocol to enable, um, people to bring their social graph, you know, the things, the, the connections to people and things that they, they value with them on those journeys. So when you're going between these different applications, and experiences um you don't have to create these kind of islands of community or islands of friends or islands of um of things that you love they come with you everywhere you go and so you can have that portability of of community of friendship and of of communications between these different experiences and then the next layer on top of that would be like how do you find all this stuff you know when we think about 
um, finding stuff on the internet, you know, the first thing that pops into pretty much everyone in the Western world, at least mine is, is Google. Um, and that's synonymous with finding things. Um, but there, are, there isn't really a place you go and to find things in the metaverse, certainly not the open metaverse anyway. Um, and so we, you know, the ideas that have been brought to life in, in, in his book and in the movies kind of center around this idea of discoverability. It's a place you can land um, that you can go in and jump into different experiences from. And so that'll be the next thing, um, you know, your next, next layer on that, on that technology stack is, is discoverability. We want to launch a place where anyone who's a creator in the open metaverse can be found. Um, and using some of the super cool, you know, AI technology that we've been developing um, to enable that next generation discovery journey and creative journey journey inside of those spaces, um, enabling people to leverage these tools that we've built to build their own spaces that people can find and jump in and explore. Um, and so bringing discoverability and user created um, content together, that's the next layer. And then last of all, and this is where I'm going to be very careful, um, you know, we really want to bring the IP to life, you know, and and demonstrate, I think even looking at our backgrounds, there's a, probably a little bit of a hint there, um, you know, how people can now, um, you know, like Ernie said, the technology has got to the point where we can start to to really showcase those ideas and that imagination in an, in, in a, in a, an immersive space that people can go and, ex and explore and, and, um, and play with, you know, I think Dan had a really good line before um, about, you know, doing things, doing things with the things they love, you know, um, and we really want to do that for, for this beloved IP and other IP that we're bringing into the Readyverse. Okay, so you just gave us a really good overview of how content matters and how it all comes together. So now, how do we bring it to life at scale? We've heard the whole, the metaverse is dead, long live AI, a AI is, is now the thing, but that would allow for an exponential content creation. So what's going to happen with all of that content? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the, you've hit the nail on the head there. Um, this kind of notion that um, AI lives in this vacuum outside of the rest of um, technology is kind of a interesting one. You know, people on the one hand will be out there with all the belief in the world saying that generative AI, you know, is the future of creativity and on the, in the same breath say the metaverse is dead. Um, and I think that those two things are completely incompatible. You know, um, if we empower a new generation of creativity and extend creative superpowers um to more people through generative ai that content has to have somewhere to live and i think the genesis of all the great metaverse stories starts with some world building technology and that's what generative ai is um and so the last piece of the puzzle i guess that we brought together to kind of help uh, make the the readyverse um you know a reality is um, artificial intelligence. And we've been working on like two parts to that over the last five years. Um, one is generative technology. So a good example of that is Gen, our, our generative music um, AI. This is a novel um, AI model that's been designed to um, help people create sounds and music, um, sound effects, those kinds of things um, that they can add to their content or create content with. Um, and I think really interesting and uniquely and reflective of the way that we view AI um, focused on um, protecting creator copyright, you know, and um, helping them monetize their works and the way that these models are train trained. And that's kind of a deeply held belief about how we want to kind of approach AI. So we've got tools that help people create content, whether that's music or 3D content, you know, the kinds of things that need to live in these spaces. Um, and then the other part is about how do you like bring that content to life? Um, you know, about five years ago, we really envisioned um, this world where a lot of the content that exists in um, the future metaverse would be powered by um, autonomous agents. Um, and what we wanted to do was create a way for people to um, have a stake in that economy. 
um, and to be the owners of those agents and to not necessarily cede all of that to big tech companies. And so um, we invented this protocol, the, the altered state machine protocol, which is now um, patented um, and enables people to um, own uh, artificial intelligence agents and carry them with them into these different worlds and applications. Um, so we've got an interesting stack of technology around how to bring different kinds of agents into into life and make those interoperable across multiple worlds and feel like if you go from you know one um, application to another application that that agent and the memories and the knowledge about you follows you through those experiences. The autonomous agent point is a really good one because as other people know as NPCs, and when you think about yeah. the fact that a lot of people now, and even exponentially as the masses obtain more digital assets, are going to have wallets full of avatars and assets that can all come to life. They're not going to be able to operate these assets. Those assets are going to need a form of intelligence. So will you take us through the altered state machine patent that is mm. really special here because it allows us to have digital intelligence and artificial intelligence owned by an individual and place that intelligence in effectively an NPC to allow it to go through the world and do things for you. Yeah, and the protocol's got two, like really interesting bits to it. Um, one is this kind of notion of attaching ownership to a non-fungible token. Um, and then that way, um, users who own those tokens can then um, own the intelligence behind them. Um, and that makes them kind of portable and interoperable and tradable. And the other idea is this idea of the uh, genome matrix. And this is a way to put data into that token that gives um, uniqueness to it in this landscape of lots of different agents interacting. You know, mm -hmm. um, what we don't want is have like one like super AI that kind of thinks the same way about every interaction. And so um, part of the protocol allows us to in introduce a layer of randomness um, or a layer of data that can help um, those um, agents behave in a different way that might reflect, um, you know, uh, our individual personalities or likes and dislikes or experiences that we've gathered over time or information that's get built up around our characters over time um, and have that influence the way that these AI models behave and interact with each other. And that can apply to like end users as in, uh, as characters in games or it could um, be digital agents, you know, NPCs like you talked about earlier. It could even be environments and objects. So you can embed the brand essence of your brand inside an object and that will make the avatars around it feel and behave a different way. Um, and so you can do all these quite exciting things and, and bring more life and more of that immersiveness that we talked about into these digital experiences. That brings us to the point of brands and the ability for a brand to dip their toe into this. They don't necessarily have to build an entire world. There are specific things like yeah. you just mentioned where they can add intelligence to a particular asset or where digital and physical can blend, which is a lot of what we'll see as we build out the Readyverse and launch experiences in the Readyverse where the things that you do digitally can bridge right to the things that you do physically. I think people think that yeah. these are separate spaces, but like we always talk about, we're just in a digital world already. Mm. Yeah, totally. I mean, both like in, re in in the kind of reality, you know, we spend a lot of time immersed in digital spaces. I think, um, you know, something like 44 years of our life will spend looking at a, a screen on average these days. And so you're in this metaverse already. And, and that kind of digital and physical thing is a real thing. If you survey, um, you know, the, uh, the younger generations, you know, a huge amount of the uh, influence about what they want to purchase in the real world, what they want to wear, um, what brands they want to be associated with is driven by those interactions in digital spaces and immersive spaces. And that trend is not going away. Um, so and so being start. able to kind of take that next layer of, um, of interactivity and immersiveness into the way that your agents feel and respond bond to environments and the things they interact with is kind of a, another step on that journey of building that emotional connection with consumers. On that piece of data and the younger generation wanting to change accessories, 
why don't you take us through the swappables engine, which is a huge other component of the tech stack that we just rolled out and that will be exceptionally used and necessary throughout the Readyverse. Yeah, so if we kind of talked about earlier about having these um, ways to generate content that's interoperable, another really important part of that is being able to generate the things that they interact or make the things they interact with um, interoperable, and we call that swappable. Um, and so you see Parzival wearing some digital items behind you. Well, how do you make that work on a different kind of character that might have a different kind of body shape? Um, how do you make it um, adapt for a different environment if it's played over here in one engine and wants to go over here in another engine? So that's what that's what Swappable's engine does. It provides that interactive that um, layer for um, items and objects that can be associated with these characters, or you know bits and pieces if it's like parts on a car or a robot or something like that. Um, the the complexity behind making these individual things that could be owned on different kinds of blockchains um, interact with each other and the set of rules around the, how they interact with each other and what they're compatible with and how they're presented inside of these engines is what Swappables is all about. Yeah, I think it's an amazing example to hear and to think about if you want to put this gene vest onto a large party bear or a small fluff. Yeah how that happens. Yeah. I don't think people realize exactly what we're doing behind the scenes to make all these things look magical, but. Yeah, and I think Ernie, Ernie, Ernie's talked about, you know, having an item like a sword. Well, what about in a world that, you know, um, magic is a core part of it. Is that now a sword or is that a wand? You know, the rules around those interactions and where things can be used and not used and the ontology of those things is all behind the scenes sitting in this stack called swappables that that is powered by our asset register okay you didn't you didn't end with the netflix metaphor and now the netflix analogy yeah i think like back to ernie's um actually earlier um statement about how complicated it was you know ernie was was an engineer back in the early days of the internet and so was i and um and you know, you had all these different kind of moving bits that had to be brought together. And everyone at that time was actually interacting with those discrete things. You have know, talked about five, five different bits of technology bringing, you know, this kind of experience to life just in my last bit there. And what we've done, I think, in Web3 in the past is um, not focused enough on making that, that the magic of that um, invisible to people. Um, and the internet really didn't take off until that happened, until we put all of those things behind the scenes and made it just a joyful experience for people to get on board with. And so, um, you know, imagine if in order to sign up to Netflix, you had to understand who hosted that um, service, you know, it was hosted on this cloud. And then imagine you had to go and buy some credits from that cloud in order to, um, to, to, be able to view the service and then you had to pay on top of that um, Netflix for the service and then in order to do that you had to be able to run a survey like all of these things we kind of force onto people in the past in web3 um, in order for them to do some quite simple things um, and so that's big part of what we've been doing is trying to make that journey really simple really seamless um, and and make the experience magical and I also want to kind of add to that that um, you know, content has led the evolution of the internet in almost every instance. And, and I think that that's why this is such a powerful opportunity and why we see it as so exciting is because Ready Player One as a piece of content showed us what's possible and what we should be delivering to. It showed us the ideal standard. And so being able to work to deliver that outcome um, and make that magic come to life with the framework of that content is what's really special. You know, what's really interesting uh, to build off your point on the components that we're, we're using as foundational themes from the books and of course the movie. It's interesting because people always say, well, with the metaverse and with the digitization of society, we're going to lose connection and we're going to lose our ability to connect with people. And my response is always, no, it's only going to get stronger. Ready Player One was a love story. And that's what people don't understand is that the connection that we can have to humans knows no boundary. It doesn't have to be physical. It's energetic and it can be so much more. And the love component is really interesting. And 
really hopeful and really promising because all of the things that Aaron just outlined so in such a detailed way about the technology is actually all about where anything can be connected to anything. Whether that's a human, whether that's a piece of technology connecting to another piece, whether that's a identity telling another world that I can enter because I have access or a world saying, no, you can't come in here with a gun. There are ways to put frameworks around things that are for the betterment of society. Maybe the world should learn a thing or two about that. But that's really the theme of what we're doing is really built around improving connection in all ways. And, and that comes with a lot of love. So we've gone really deep. We've said a lot. So now in order to wrap this up, I want to do something fun. So my favorite thing about all four of you, which is getting more popular in society, but it's definitely very special about this group is we're all massive manifestors, massive manifestors. Everything is effectively a story of us manifesting something and, and something coming to light. So I want to go around. Dan, you're first. I, you're giving you the first, uh, the hot uh -oh. seat. And I want you to uh, <clears throat> share something that you feel like was manifested to put us here right now. A memory you have that you feel like, oh, that was a sign that I was going to end up here. <clears throat> Uh, and Aaron, Ernie, uh, here's, here's, answers. here's one, here's one. Ernie and I met for the first time at South by Southwest in 2006. And in that first hangout, he started telling me about Ready Player One and his, the book he was writing and his vision for a future changed by technology. And, um, you know, we talked about how we would love to like, A, you know, Turn that into an epic. Like one day be a part of bringing those ideas uh, for the future to life. Um, we were super fortunate in that we got to make this epic movie with the greatest filmmaker of all time, Steven Spielberg. And uh, it was it was in two thousand and eighteen when the movie was done, and we needed to, we were planning a first surprise screening. Um, and we ended up coincidentally doing the first surprise screening of Ready Player One at South by Southwest on literally the exact same day in March that Ernie and I had met back in 2006, three blocks away. We did it at the Paramount Theater in Austin, Texas, which was literally three blocks away from where Ernie and I first talked about it. And it and 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 it also coincidentally um, uh, the release of the movie landed on Ernie's birthday. And it just felt, I guess when I think about these things that just like came together in this crazy, perfect way, I feel like it was just put us on a, you know, uh, a trajectory for it to be, for it to be destiny to also, you know, have this happen where we bring these, you know, all these ideas for the future to life uh, in an ideal way with ideal partners. Um, there's four of us. There's not a high five. Maybe we need a fifth. There's four of us. The high four. Commons with us today. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. So okay. anyway, I, I was thought it was crazy. That. That, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's crazy when you look back and you're like, what are the odds of that? And and then the magic of a birthday. And it's just like you can never see it in the moment, but you can always see it later. But yeah, no, that was because of Star Wars. That's how crazy that uh uh that was when I started to question whether or not my own life was a simulation. I'm like, oh you guys aren't even trying. <laughs> like, there's no way this is real. <laughs> Uh, was when it was, uh, our movie was supposed to come out uh, in December of uh, 2017. Uh, and then uh, uh, I think Star Wars The Last Jedi took our release date. Uh, and they're like, oh, we're going to have to uh, 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 reschedule. And then they said it's going to be March 29th. And I'm like, oh, my birthday? Oh, you're going to have the... <laughs> Have it, have it. So every version of the Radio Player One poster has the release date, and it's my birthday. Wait, so every time I look at the, I'm like, is you know, it's story? Uh, that's, that's the story. That's the best. Wow. Yeah. No. Well, and I'm a kind of a Star yeah. Wars fan, as you guys can see with my Star Wars. Yeah. Part. So even to be involved in, you know, and we had Star Wars in the movie too. That was the thing that I wasn't sure was going to happen right up to the end. Yeah. Was that we would get the Star Wars license in Ready Player One, uh, but we do. There's x-wings and tie fighters you know in my steven spielberg movie it's the uh, um 
<laughs> uh, I, you know, what's crazy I, I, to answer your question, what made me know, you know, uh, that I was going to be here. Nothing. I assumed it was all going to be downhill after my Steven Spielberg <laughs> movie came out on my on my birthday. Um, uh, 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 and I got to premiere it in my hometown. The whole cast and Steven come and like appear on stage with me at the you know Paramount Theater downtown. It was crazy. I'm like, I would joke at the time. I'm like, well, you know. Have a good look, guys, because it's all downhill from here. What's that? What's that? <laughs> stop this? Nothing. You know, cool stuff could happen, but you know. But I think this is the one thing well, that we're, we're about to do that, aren't we? We're about to top oh, it. We're going to top it. That's what's you know. Uh, uh, where else could you know? I used to joke that everything that it could ever want to happen when you write your first novel had happened to me, you know. But it turns out there's one other thing, <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> for a science fiction writer, you know, and just a creative person in general. That was what you guys were saying that I wanted to echo, you know, to my fellow creatives um, uh, is, you know, when you, your intellectual property, those are like your children, you know, when you create fictional characters uh, and, you know, put your heart and soul in it, to them and spend years, you know, crafting uh, a story that's always going to have a connection to your life, the time in your life that you spent away from your family and uh, doing other things to, to create these characters and imbue them with life. Like there's, you know, it's as precious as your own uh, uh, children. So handing that off to somebody else, you know, it's like your music, it's some like for musicians creating their own music and then handing it off to somebody else, you know, uh, uh, is a scary, uh, a scary thing. And it's kind of a necessity in, uh, you know, uh, sometimes to get your stuff before a large audience um, uh, you know, in the real world, but in the metaverse, it won't be like, that's the other powerful thing, you know, uh, about it is, uh, the democrat democratization of art and being able to share your art and your creativity, anything that you can create, because you can create digital places, digital objects, every, anything that could exist in the real world, you can create in the metaverse, but then a whole bunch of things that you can't, you know, like a DeLorean that can really uh, uh fly you know uh and you know like simulate traveling through time and visiting other you know it's uh, the uh the possibilities are are limitless but but for you know it's this whole part of uh creativity especially like creating movies um uh, uh and for musicians too it's um you know aside from going to the movie or going to the concert of the musician there's not ways the rest of the time to interact with things that you love other than rewatching the same movie over and over again, which I have done, you know, I wanted to be in star Wars so bad when I was a kid, I would watch it over and over again, you know? Uh, and then where there were star Wars video games, that was the first way to simulate being inside star Wars. So I would play the hell out of every star Wars video game. Uh, uh, that came, you know, but the idea of like once all, you know, same with Lord of the Rings or other, all the franchises, but the idea, you know, the fantasy that I had of ready player one of all the, everything every kind of uh, uh uh ghostbusters and back to the future and star wars and star trek if all of it was anchored in the same you know uh, uh digital space um uh and you could move between it and take items and and characters in between like that was the one kind of um a uh, 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 huge bit of inspiration that i had the idea of planets you know like there being a star wars planet or a series of Star Wars planets, or Star Trek, or different IP having its own kind of surreal estate within the uh, uh, metaverse, and that's something that is an unexploited part of of of, uh, of uh, movies and television that um, people don't have now. It's like when a television comes, maybe there's a video game tie-in, maybe, but it's not like there's not a metaverse experience tied in with the latest movie where you can go to everybody else who's freaking out about how great that movie is and go be inside the environments of that movie with other people, uh, you know, it's going to create so many relationships and so many connections between people. Uh, like you guys were saying, it's a, you know, it's going to lay the groundwork. Like how many already, how many kids exist because their parents met inside of World of Warcraft or uh, EverQuest mm -hmm. or Fortnite or any, you know, those first uh, fledgling metaverses already were a place for people to meet and connect and live a whole other uh, life. And even in that low res, you know, 90s graphics it was still compelling more compelling than real life for a lot of people back then you know and uh it's only gotten more compelling as the real world kind of gets more uh, uh uh frightening uh the idea of you know making our dreams come true and creating a space where we can make our dreams uh uh come true and only kind of see the things that we you know to not have to be this treacherous place 
you know, and to go into the space and feel protected, like you're not going <clears> to <throat> see the worst <laughs> things that you see on the internet. You know, the internet, it became a treacherous place. It wasn't at the beginning, but, you know, uh, and, and it was because the kind of the, the guardrails were, uh, were, or maybe there were never really any uh, uh, guardrails in place. So I mean, it's exciting to think about, uh, 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 you know, just getting to share my ideas with you guys and then, you know, and uh, who are actually, you know, it's where the rubber meets the road. I, you know, I appreciate you guys uh, 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 giving me, playing such a, a big role, you know, my involvement, but really I just get to do what I do all the time, which is daydream and, and cook up, you know, fun ideas. And this is stuff that I spent years thinking about for my books anyway, so to get to share it with you while you guys are actually where the rubber meets the road, you're really, you know, laying the cornerstones of, of the foundation of what I imagined. It's just the coolest thing ever. And I'm so excited for other people, uh, uh, creative people to get to see this happen with their uh, IP, you know, uh, I mean, you can kind of see it like with the Hogwarts video game was one example that I thought about recently, like people grew up with Harry Potter, love Harry Potter, want to be inside of Harry Potter wish they could go to Hogwarts and when that video came came out it was like a huge thing for all those fans to get to go and and exist and share that experience uh, online but it was still just one person at a time going into Hogwarts not every hog every Harry Potter fan in the world going to a convention at Hogwarts in the metaverse like the potential of you know uh, 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 connecting with other people who share your passions and your love of different uh, IP is huge. And it's, you know, uh, it's really, it gives me something to look forward to. I'm excited about experiencing it myself. Well, you said a ton of things that will probably manifest into reality from that. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone here is a manifester. So Aaron, what is your moment? By the way, Ernie, I loved all of that. I, Thank every, you. you said, you said about five things that I'm not gonna put a spotlight on because People will figure them out that are actually uh, <laughs> coming to life already. So people can go back and listen to some of the things you said because they're already in progress and in manifestation mode. So I love it. Aaron, what is your what was your sign that this would all be? Um, it's really hard to pick one because there's just been so many incredible moments. But I actually think that that time we went to dinner and just hung out in LA and had some pizza together was one of the moments where I felt like, shit, this is, this is really going to happen, you know? And, um, you know, just low key, you know, for people nerding out about the future of the internet and being on that vibe that, um, is hard to ever come across in life. You know, you can, you can, you do, we do business with a lot of people around the world. And uh, it's very um, rarely that you kind of get into a situation with people that you're going to go into something like this with and be able to just for the first time in person meet up and and have that connectivity and shared values and and shared um, vision for what the future could be could be. And I think that that was a really special moment, um, you know, in this journey that that kind of foretold that we would get there. You know, we, there's a lot of work that had to happen after that but it felt like we you know we were the team that was going to make it happen yeah. we made it happen you guys i can't believe it's actually it happened. so long <laughs> waiting like is it gonna happen are we gonna be able to and here we are it's pretty, yeah. Yeah. It's pretty crazy yeah i sent you guys last night a picture that was one of the first press photos i ever took and it was actually from like 10 years ago or more in front of a delorean and one of my friends I <laughs> I texted it to one of my friends last night who met me after that photo was taken and it, that photo was never actually released. It was for a photo shoot and they actually, I don't know why they didn't pick the DeLorean one. I think they didn't want to like get too creative. They wanted like <laughs> me in front of a boring wall, but the DeLorean photo, I sent it to one of my friends and she's like, oh, why did you take that photo? And I was like, oh, because my favorite movie is Back to the Future. And that was one of the things at the time I was telling the journalist the story she had asked what well, is my favorite movie? I said, Back to the Future. And she goes, I'm not sure that that's why you took the picture. And I was like, oh, why? And she goes, I think you took the picture because of what you're about to announce tomorrow. And I was like, <laughs> that was the manifestation moment where I realized maybe my DeLorean photo shoot was all pointing to this 
and your love for DeLoreans and the, I'm sure the epic battle it was to get them in the movie and uh, maybe some stuff we'll do with them in the future. So I will leave it there and say that uh, I think we've all shared our love fest. So everyone knows how excited we are to be working together and what Readyverse Studios will go on to do will be really, really special because we wouldn't have it any other way. So Dan and Ernie, thank you for uh, trusting us. And this is just the beginning of all of the stuff we'll showcase for everyone. And Aaron wouldn't rather be in partnership with anyone else. So my salute to you. Yeah, totally. Back, 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 at, you. Front, yeah, back at you guys. We yeah. have to see, we have to see the, uh, the tour of Ernie's. Oh yeah. Oh, quick Ernie. tour. Hey, oh, yeah, sorry. you know, I realized I'd never gotten to show you guys my garage. You just see it from this perspective, which is yeah, a good just so that we know it's not a background. Yeah, yeah so uh, switch the camera so we can. Yeah, see. I hooked up a, a USB camera to my fertility idol from Raiders of the Lost Ark, so I'm going to try to switch over. I'm going to switch over to the microphone on that too, <laughs> right. and then we're going to switch over to the video, and then I'll give you guys a quick tour of my newer nerd later here <laughs> right ernie do you drive those or do they just stay there? i do yeah they're both both licensed uh for operation here in texas uh i don't know if you guys have ever actually got to see inside so this one this is ecto 88 which is matchup of back to the future ghostbusters Bucker Bonsai's jet car <laughs> kit from Knight Rider. Uh, <laughs> Amazing. Turned on right now. I should turn kit on. There we go. Kit is on. Oh, wow. And then, uh, can I get R2 working? Um, this is uh, the Mandalorian work in progress. Uh, that name's so cool. The Mandalorian. Yeah, uh, you guys can see I've got. Uh, a lot of stuff from my first movie, Fanboys, is in here. Uh, uh, Fanboys, props, and uh, whatnot. And then R2, is R2 working? Yeah, R2 is working. I love this uh, handheld camera. Oh, nice. <laughs> so it's my two double DeLorean. My wife calls them Days Loreans. Uh, my uh, double DeLorean garage and this is where all my uh foreign editions uh ready player one published in like 57 oh, cool. different countries so each one has like a different cover and uh uh, uh this is my buckaroo bonsai stuff that's my new jersey boom box from buckaroo bonsai but the thing i was going to show you guys is this uh this is dope this bookshelf opens up i'll set it up back here Make sure you guys can see. Very secret. <laughs> ready one secret ready player one arcade hidden back here. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Amazing. Amazing. My black tiger machine. My ready player one action figures. I know there's that, gonna be a lot of people. Warner Brothers there. sent me all these uh, all these posters, so I had to I had to display them. <laughs> this is but, an in real life example of how people are going to decorate e. their e. Home in the metaverse. Life size ET, oh, yeah. and I got a couple <laughs> old classic video games. But and this is my big four player setup. All right, you guys have had the tour more video game geekery going on. <laughs> Anyhow, you guys got the full. Good of enough of Full a tour. tour. <laughs> right at the mix by guitar. Nerd stuff. We love it. Has has accumulated. It's a great accumulation. Oh, Aaron, you don't have to use this, but let me show this uh, to Aaron. My TRS-80. Uh, oh, dude. A plug and power light controller that I use to oh. pull stuff in my garage with my old TRS-80 color computer. That's crazy. Um, <laughs> all right i'm done love it <laughs> great tour Epic. well thanks guys we'll do it again soon